Hey guys, Will here. So today we're gonna to be taking a look at this very interesting looking contraption. This is the new Motion Plus system from Next Level Racing. Now here at Boosted Media, we've tested a variety of different motion systems ranging from $1,000 or so, all the way up to around 10,000 Australian dollars. This guy sits right in the middle at about 5,000 Australian dollars. Still a lot of money to be spending on a sim rig. So today we're gonna to put it through its paces, see exactly what it adds to the sim racing experience and find out whether this is worthy of consideration for your sim rig. Let's go. Okay, so before we get started today, just a couple of quick important housekeeping things. Firstly, a big thank you to Next Level Racing for sending this guy across to us to check out. Now, if you do decide you want to pick one of these up or any other Next Level Racing gear, there is a discount code linked down in the description below for you, as well as an affiliate link, which is a great way of helping out our work here at Boosted Media at no additional cost to you. Now, if you're interested in any of the other gear that we've looked at today as well, or anything else that you might've seen in our reviews, hit up boostedmedia.net. There's a whole bunch of different discounts there, as well as product reviews, all the things that you're gonna need to figure out what gear is gonna suit you best. And we really do appreciate your support in that way. So thank you very much. And thanks once again to Next Level Racing for sending this across to us to check out. So there's quite a few things to go through today. We're gonna to start off by having a look at the hardware and I guess explaining exactly what this is and how it works. Cause it does look quite different from a lot of the other motion systems that you might've seen before. We've seen seat movers before. We've seen four actuator systems before. And uh, yeah, this kind of sits in between the two. So the way this system works is you've got the active module sitting under the front of your rig. So somewhere around your pedal plate area. And you can see there's two actuators down the bottom here. And that is gonna allow the entire rig, rather than just the seat, to move from side to side, like so. So you can imagine this entire module is moving relative to the ground. Then at the back of the rig, so somewhere underneath your bottom, you've got this guillotine blade looking thing, which is gonna allow the rig to roll from side to side, as well as pitch from front to rear too. So you can imagine whatever this does, the rest of the rig is able to replicate without any active devices sitting on the rear of the rig. So what that means is that you have two degrees of freedom. So you've got pitch, which is the entire rig moving forward and back like that. And then you've got roll, which is, you guessed it, the rig moving from side to side. Now a three degrees of freedom system like you get with say a D-Box or the Sigma Integrale system that we looked at just recently adds heave on top of that. Now heave is the sensation of the entire rig moving up and down in unison. It's a really great way of simulating, I guess, instantaneous movements or textures such as bumps in the road, sudden compression in the suspension as you go down a big dip or up over a crest or something like that. Basically anything where the entire car is moving in unison with the body of the car relative to the wheels or the suspension, as opposed to the sensation of the car kind of kicking to one side as you go around a turn or you know bump up over a curve, which can be quite accurately simulated just with the roll effect. So in terms of degrees of freedom, this is exactly the same as a seat mover system, but obviously it's moving the entire rig rather than just the seat on its own. And that obviously has the benefit of your body position not moving relative to the steering wheel or the pedals. Now I did run a next level racing seat mover on my rig for a number of years in fact, and I was always quite impressed with it. I always made sure I had the motion turned down relatively low, so I wasn't sort of being thrown around all over the place. And that definitely did have its weaknesses. One of the big weaknesses of that system is that obviously any movement between the seat of your pants and your foot position, your pedal position, your wheel position is gonna have an impact on muscle memory. You can imagine if you push the brake and every time you push the brake, your bottom is in a slightly different position, it's not always gonna feel exactly the same. And that can definitely have a detrimental impact on overall performance. And while I loved the immersion that was provided by the 2DOF seat mover, I did find that I was faster and more consistent when I moved over to the 3DOF D-Box system. And I actually ended up selling my next level racing seat mover, which I did pay for. Now there is the option of course of running the seat mover in addition to this, but I have a hunch that this is probably gonna provide all of the sensation that we're gonna need. And obviously we'll discuss that later on when we get up and driving. So we've talked about 2DOF and 3DOF systems with pitch, roll and heave, but the other elements that you can add on top of pitch, roll and heave are sway and yaw. So traction loss systems, which have the ability to move the front and the rear independently will give you a sway effect where the entire rig kind of pivots around the center and can move from side to side. You also have traction loss systems which only move the rear and that gives you the sensation of yaw or the rig kind of rotating around a central point in the nose. And then you also have what's called surge, which is the entire rig sliding forward or backward depending on whether you're braking or accelerating. So pitch, roll, heave, sway, yaw, 
and surge are the most commonly used motion systems. And the biggest limitation is simply that we're not able to simulate sustained G-force. And no motion system that I'm aware of on the consumer market at least is able to really achieve that. But you can imagine with any motion system, once it reaches its full scale deflection, once it can't move any further, it's not really able to give you that sensation of sustained G-force. And that's just always gonna be a limitation when it comes to these motion systems. So the first thing you need to know about this is even though it is branded as a next level racing product, it's actually manufactured by Motion Systems EU, which is the same company that makes their traction loss system and their seat mover. Now, if you have a poke around on their website, you'll see that they really know what they're doing when it comes to motion systems. They manufacture some massive industrial grade simulation rigs with full scale movement, installation for things like pilot training and all kinds of neat stuff like that. So definitely check out their website. It'll give you a good sense of just the kind of quality that we're expecting to see here and their experience when it comes to developing motion systems. But I've got to say, I mean, obviously you're expecting to see high quality hardware for the price here. And this is on par with what we've seen from the seat mover and the traction loss system in the past as well. So no real surprises for me, but you can see nice solid construction here. Anywhere we were mounting brackets or putting any kind of load on the system is all reinforced with extra layers of steel. And yeah, just it has the, it gives you the impression of a really solid hefty piece of, uh, of hardware. Now in terms of assembly and construction, what you actually get inside the Box. You do have to assemble this kind of foot piece here. You can see there's a central little arm here which reinforces it and it actually comes shipped as two separate legs. There's 16 bolts which you need to put in to assemble the feet here and then you also just need to install the little brackets on the end of our guillotine blade which sits at the rear. Happy to say, as is the case with all Next Level Racing products that we've reviewed over the years, very, very detailed instruction manual. They also have a video assembly guide too, which is the reason why we're not really including that in this video. Don't really need to show you that again. It also includes schematics with all the measurements and everything as well. So if you are looking at implementing one of these on a non-Next Level Racing rig, then it should be pretty straightforward to do so, obviously depending on the dimensions of your rig. Now it does come out of the box with provision for mounting on the Next Level Racing Elite Series. So the FGT Elite as well as the GT Elite. We're gonna be testing it on the GT Elite in today's video. You can also mount it directly onto a GT track as well. So it comes in the box with two little mounting brackets for the Elite Series. And then for the GT track, it literally bolts through the sides of the rig and into the mounting holes on the surface of this. And it's all very, very accurately detailed in the manual here so you can see how everything goes. So just to give you an idea in terms of footprint, I'm not gonna go through all the dimensions here, you guys can see for yourselves. We've got 700 millimeters wide from the edge of the foot to the edge of the foot, 458 millimeters wide for the rig itself. And there are some holes in the feet too, which have centers of 620 millimeters. So if you are wanting to mount this onto some sort of a traction loss system, like the Next Level Racing Traction Plus system, then you do have the ability to do that too. You're just gonna obviously have to be aware of those dimensions. So other than that, there's really not a whole lot of other things to mention here externally. We've got some cooling fans in here as well. It'll be interesting to see how loud those are a little later on. We've got our main power switch here. We've got our IEC connection with the ground for our power connection and then also a USB cable and some indicator lights here to let you know the status of the system. And for those wondering, it does come supplied with a two meter long USB cable and power cable. So what we'll do now is pop the top cover off so we can have a bit of a look-see at the build quality internally. While we're doing that, we're also gonna discuss a couple of other important factors like response time, weight limitations, power draw, and all those important things. Okay, so we've popped the top cover off here to have a bit of a look inside. And the first thing you're gonna notice straight away is the two big electric motors which are driving those feet up and down. Now, if I look down inside, I can't really get a nice clean look at exactly how it goes from driving from this angle to that angle. I assume it's some sort of a worm drive or something like that, which is driving it up and down. But there is some sort of a gearbox assembly in there, which is obviously making the feet move up and down. The motors are sitting here. Now, one of the things that I noticed straight away as well is the four millimeter thick steel chassis, which is basically encasing everything internally here. So the motors are all mounted to that. Everything that is a moving part is mounted to that same solid structure. And then you can see the threaded inserts for mounting from the top here, as well as the threads that are tapped in the side for the mounting brackets we looked at earlier, are all a part of that one structure. That's gonna give us a lot of rigidity there. There's a couple of other things that stand out here as well. I noticed that they're using Sunon branded maglev fans as well. They're actually a brand of fan that I used to use when I was uh, installing fans in military spec equipment many, many, many years ago now. So definitely a brand that's familiar to me and one that is known for very, very high quality. So that is a good indicator that there's no expense spared 
when it comes to the component tree that they're using in here to get the job done as efficiently as possible. Another thing that I saw straight away as well is the use of Dynamat internally here as well. Now that is an acoustic deadening material. I actually lined the entire shell of my uh, old car with Dynamat to improve the acoustics and uh, reduce the amount of sound spill externally. So very interesting to see that used here as well. But again, that is a very expensive material and not something that I would have expected to see used here. So obviously they're thinking of the end user and trying to keep that noise level down as much as possible. So by my count, there's three cooling fans at least that I can see in here, obviously the two electric motors. Then down the bottom here, you can see a giant aluminum heatsink that would be sitting on top of our power delivery circuitry to keep the temperatures down there. So the fans are kind of blowing across that surface, which is good. And then you can see the sealed power supply unit sitting up in the corner here as well. So it is a switch mode power supply, meaning that you should be able to plug this in wherever you are in the world without the need for any other adapters. Compatible from 115 volts AC at 60 Hertz, right the way through to 230 volts AC at 50 Hertz. Uh, so that's not gonna be any issue here for us in Australia. 321 watts total rated power for the power supply as well. So obviously that is only ever gonna reach anywhere near that under peak conditions when it's actually you know physically moving something. The amount of weight and load that you have on the system will obviously determine how much actual real world power draw there is, but it can be anywhere up to 321 watts before we start to run into protection. Now in terms of protection as well, we do have short circuit protection, overload protection, over voltage protection, and over temperature protection. And you can see there the ground strap running through to the outer shell as well. So yeah, look, I see no alarm bells here whatsoever. Obviously it screams quality internally. So with the configuration that we have these motors in here with the particular gearboxes that they've chosen, they're able to support a weight of 250 kilograms for the total cockpit. And remembering that this is gonna be responsible for moving your pedals, your rig itself, the steering wheel, potentially your monitor or monitors as well. And of course, whatever your weight is on top of that as well. So make sure that you factor all that in if you are looking at buying one of these. We have seen other motion systems at around this price point, which do support more weight than that, but I think 250 kilograms should be okay for the majority of people. So I don't think that's gonna be a big concern. But yeah, absolutely nothing at all to complain about here in terms of build quality, at least from my perspective. You guys can see for yourselves if there's anything that bothers you, let us know in the comments. But I'm seeing good design choices everywhere, good quality hardware, and yeah, I see absolutely no cause for concern whatsoever. Okay, so the Motion Platform Plus is now mounted up on our Next Level Racing GT Elite cockpit, one of the three cockpits that this is compatible with straight out of the box without any need for any DIY. Now, the installation was relatively straightforward. It would be pretty tricky to do on your own if you don't strip the cockpit down. Now, the instructions that they provide suggest that you go all the way down to just the base frame, flip it upside down, mount everything. Because there's two of us here and we were able to do so, we just sat the rig up on top of a couple of boxes and then just bolted everything in from the underside. But I would definitely recommend if it is an option for you, get a second person to help out with the installation. Remember again, the unit is 18 and a half kilograms, so it is heavy enough that it's easy to drop and you could obviously cause some pretty serious damage, not only to yourself, but to the unit and other things if you were to drop it. But it did all bolt up exactly the way they said it would and there was no issues there whatsoever. Now, just quickly before we dive into the software, you've probably already noticed that when I'm chatting here, the rig is actually rocking from side to side or rolling quite a lot. Now that is due to the lash in the gear system here. It was very similar with the Next Level Racing Motion Platform V3, which is the seat mover, which we used to run on our rig. And it's simply just a byproduct of the way this is designed. Obviously, there has to be a little bit of lash in the gears themselves or a little bit of free play. Otherwise, it would bind and it would just tear itself to shreds as soon as anything moved. But I think it's important to address it here before we get a ton of comments down below, simply because it isn't something that we've come across before with our full rig motion systems that we've tested in the past, although it did happen with the Next Level Racing seat mover. And just so you're aware, it is something that is present also when the system is turned on and engaged, so be aware of that. Now, another observation I had too was that we have that passive ventilation at the top of the unit, and it didn't really sort of occur to me when we were looking at it in the hardware section earlier on, but once I mounted it on the rig, what I don't like is the fact that that creates a passageway for dirt and debris off your shoes to fall directly into the unit. Obviously any conductive material like metal shavings that might fall down inside there could cause the unit to short out, but we don't want dirt and debris getting inside and clogging up those mechanisms and gearboxes either. Now, obviously the impact that this has is gonna be variable depending on the type of pedals that you have on your rig. If you've got a really big pedal plate which covers the entire area, then it's obviously gonna be less of an issue. But if I end up leaving this on the rig, I will absolutely 
be fabricating some sort of a metal plate that still allows air to pass through, but isn't going to allow dirt and debris to fall inside. So let's take a quick look now at the Next Level Racing Platform Manager software. Now this is a kind of unified system, exactly the same software also is used for the Motion Platform V3 seat mover, as well as their Traction Plus system. So any additional accessories that are added into this ecosystem later on, I would presume will also use this same software and it all integrates quite nicely together. Now that is one thing that I think is an important differentiator here. So something that should not be understated. While it is possible with Motion to have different peripherals from different brands, you can imagine if you've got pitch roll and heave from one particular brand and then you want to add a traction loss system from another brand, you're going to most likely end up having to run two different software packages and it can be quite tricky, although not impossible to get those to sort of play nicely together. So having everything in the one place is definitely an important factor. So let's quickly run through what we have here. There's some really powerful features in this software. So by default, it's going to show all the games that it's compatible with. And these are basically, you can think of these as profiles for each game. So what we can do here is drop this menu down and change it to only installed. And that will filter out all the things that we don't have installed on this particular PC. And then each of these is a profile which you can click on. So we'll click on the iRacing profile, for example, and that is going to take us into the settings for each individual game. And we'll run through these and talk about exactly what they do in just a minute. But I want to stay on the main menu just for now. Along the bottom here, we've got a couple of icons for various different commonly used features. There's also a pause or park button here too. Now you can assign a key on your keyboard to act as an emergency stop switch if you need it. So in lieu of a physical switch that you can hit if there is some sort of an emergency situation, and we have had them in the past, so it's not something to joke about. Uh, it is good that you can at least have a hot key assigned on your keyboard for that function. Now, if we look down the right hand side here, we've got a tab for tools and diagnostics. There's a couple of interesting things here. You can go in, you can do firmware updates. It's all pretty straightforward. I don't really see the need to go through all of that in detail now, but there are a couple of standout things here, which I think are worth calling out. So firstly, we do have VR Headway 2.0 as well as Screenway which is an experimental feature, motion compensation. So when you're driving with a VR headset, you can imagine that movement in the cockpit can translate into erratic movement inside the game that may be unwanted in some particular scenarios. So it's good that they have the feature to allow you to compensate for that in the VR headset. Now, if we click down to Screenway, it says that this is only recommended for use with sway and yaw or traction loss scenarios. It says roll and pitch compensation seems to not be necessary. So it has integration via APIs for R-Factor 2 X-Plane 11 and then via the standard free track or track IR API emulation for Assetto Corsa, ACC, BeamNG, DCS World, Dirt Rally 2, iRacing, and R-Factor 2. So we'll skip over the rest of that stuff for now. A couple other things here, tactile audio-based feedback configuration. So you can set this software up to use the telemetry coming in to drive things like butt kickers or tactile transducers on your rig. And that is something that I did actually use for my butt kicker previously when I was running the, uh, when I was running the Motion Platform V3. And I did find it did a very good job of it. I actually ended up using SimHub instead in the end just because there's a little bit more configuration available there. But for those who want to keep things simple and not have to open multiple software packages, it's great that this is integrated here. And you can see here multiple channel outputs, device mapping, and so forth. So good to see there. And then if we continue down here, we also have OBD2 simulation, which is a really cool feature. It allows us to actually interface with your sim rig with third party devices that might interface with the OBD2 port in your car. So if you've got a phone app, for example, that you like to use to see dash readouts and things like that in your car, you can actually use it in your sim rig as well. These days there are quite a lot of physical gauges which you can install in your car, which interface via OBD2 as well. So this opens up a lot of opportunities with regards to things like that. And you can see here, it uses all the standard PIDs for things like water temperature, engine map, RPM, vehicle speed, and so forth. So if it works in your car, theoretically, it should also work on your sim rig too. So it's cool to see them thinking outside the box and adding in funky little features like that. So scrolling on down, we've got game integration, which allows us to configure the various different parameters for games if they need to have some sort of a configuration done. And you'll notice here under Action Center, if it detects a game and it says that you need to do something to make it work, generally speaking, there'll be a button that allows you to make whatever changes are necessary to make that happen without having to go in and change files and whatnot. So 
in my experience, and again, I have used this software for a number of years now, this works really well. And I've never actually come into a scenario where I wasn't able to get something working at least once they've updated the software to be compatible with any new titles that come out. So that is all good. Help and support, pretty self-explanatory. There's quite a few things here you can do like uh, uninstalling, reinstalling various different game integrations, uh, repairing the base software. You can also take a snapshot here to send a zip file back to Next Level Racing if you have a problem so they can have a look at the exact parameters of your system and help you troubleshoot. And we did actually need to do that because of an issue that we had which I'll cover in just a minute. Uh, motion compensation, we already took a look at that guy, and then obviously a button to exit the program. So let's jump in now and take a look at exactly what you can do in terms of adjustment in the profiles themselves. So again, remembering we have individual profiles for each of the games. Now, if you do wanna set up separate profiles for individual vehicles or tracks, what you can do is clone these profiles and then you can simply just click on the one that you want for whichever car you happen to be driving. But the software does do a good job of detecting what game you're playing and automatically switch to that profile by default. And you can set up favorites here as well to make it a little bit easier to navigate. So going through the tabs on the right hand side, you can see there's a whole bunch of things that we can do here. We've got an adjustment here for weight transfer bias, negative value amplifiers, acceleration effects, positive value amplifiers, braking effects. So what that allow you to do is create a bias between the sensation of accelerating or moving back in your seat and braking. I generally like to have a more exaggerated effect under braking rather than acceleration. I find acceleration can feel a little bit over exaggerated anyway. So that works quite well. I generally will run that more towards the rear. Uh, chassis motion, again, this is all gonna be very, very subjective stuff. So we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time here, but just to give you an understanding here, overall intensity, that works like a basic gain control for all of the effects underneath. Bumps intensity, self-explanatory, chassis roll gain, so the amount of roll that you have in the rig. Pitch gain, amount of pitch that you have in the rig. Vertical G-force gain, so this would be relating to the sensation of heave or the rig moving up and down. Now remembering again that this particular motion platform doesn't have dedicated heave, but it can still tilt the rig up and down by moving the actuators up and down in unison. So you will still get a sensation of kind of going over bumps. And again, we'll talk about that when we're driving in just a minute, but that's gonna adjust the gain level there. Longitudinal G-force gain and then lateral G-force gain so again, sensations of cornering and whatnot. So chassis motion is all relating to how the car is moving relative to the environment outside with relation to suspension and G-force. Now, if we move on to SFX, this is relating to things like bouncing off a rev limiter, gear change sensations, and whatnot. So you can have a nice mechanical thud every time you change gear. You can also have the entire rig shake when you're bouncing off a limiter, which is something that I generally will turn right down or switch off entirely. I just find it feels quite unrealistic and doesn't really suit me. But again, you may not agree with that. You may actually like it. So it's worth experimenting with. So moving on to motion post-processing. Now this allows us to apply modifiers to the final output signal. Now, one thing we did have to do was flip the output signal around uh, and basically reverse the motion. What we found is when we plugged the system in, the motion was actually running backwards in terms of the roll. So when we were turning to the right, the rig was leaning to the right when it should be simulating G-force and actually pushing you to the outside. Now we got in touch with Next Level Racing, and this is where I was saying we went through the diagnostic process earlier and sent stuff across. Uh, they weren't actually able to figure out why that was happening. They said the other units which they've sent out to reviewers and the ones that they've sold haven't had that problem, but we were able to resolve it by simply just flipping the output signal around and basically reversing it. So not sure what happened there. Uh, we didn't pull any electronics apart or anything when we were looking inside earlier. All we did was pop that cover off. So it wasn't something that we did, but we may have a poke around inside and maybe see if they've plugged the motors into the wrong outputs or something like that. But anyway, it is what it is. We were able to get around the problem by flipping the output signal here. But essentially what this is doing is allowing us to adjust linearity here. So you can see if it's maxed out at minus six or plus six, you've got a linear curve from zero to 100%. If we modify that, then what that's gonna do is give you a more profound initial movement and then taper off and smoothen after that. And then we can also adjust the gain level there too. So essentially what that's doing is increasing the amplitude of smaller movements whilst limiting the maximum amount of movement that the rig is going to experience. And then we can also adjust the offset there as well. So you can see as we increase that offset, it's basically adjusting the Q. So it's adjusting how much of the range is being influenced by the curve. And then you can see it tapers off at the end there. So we're gonna wind that back and back to here. And then we can do the same thing for pitch as well. So independent controls for each. Moving on down to VR headway, some controls there for pitch roll and smoothness compensation for VR as we discussed before. 
And then we can also set up some behaviors here as well. So when we pause the game, do we want it to center itself? Do we want it to stop immediately? Or do we want it to go into the park position? So time to get in and do some driving tests. We're gonna test this out with a range of different SIM titles. We're also gonna test with front and rear mounting the module as well. Next Level Racing recommend that you start off with it mounted under the front. They say that's gonna provide the maximum amount of immersion. Now, what I'm, what I'm experiencing so far is that with it mounted under the front, you do get quite a lot of sensation of the entire car kind of rolling forward and backwards because obviously it's pivoting underneath your bottom and the entire thing is kind of going like that underneath you. Whereas with the module mounted underneath the rear, you're gonna get more of a sensation of heave or the rig moving up and down because most of the tilt is happening away from your torso and your head. So let's roll some driving test footage now and have a chat about our experiences. Okay, so we've been putting this through its paces for a number of days now, testing across a variety of different sim titles and a wide variety of different types of cars as well. Obviously, different types of cars and the way you're actually gonna feel the action of the suspension in those cars is gonna vary massively. So we tested it with everything from Formula One cars all the way through to stadium trucks to really get a good sense of exactly what this has to offer. And I'm happy to say that I actually ended up turning down the effects in every single scenario down to all, but probably around about 50 percent even i just found that at the maximum levels it was at the point where i was being thrown around so much that it was literally you know taking away from my ability to drive obviously you don't want to have complete sensory overload with motion you want to have it to the point where you know you're, you're feeling a little bit more detail you're getting some of that extra immersion you're getting that some i guess that nuance in what the car is doing how it's feeling how it's contacting with the road through the suspension but you don't want to be getting thrown around so much that your muscle memory goes out the door so i always say less is more with motion systems and if you guys have seen footage of me driving with my d-box system you'd know that i run that turn down pretty low as well so there were no real surprises there so i would say if you're worried about the amount of travel that this gives you compared to more expensive systems get that worry out of your mind altogether for the vast majority of people, I don't see that being an issue at all. What I wanna do now is I wanna try and save as much time as possible here. We've got a huge list of positives and negative observations from the experience over the last couple of days. So I'm gonna read these from my cheat sheet here and just elaborate a little bit on them as I go. So first positive was relatively easy to install and get up and running, especially if you have a next level racing rig, is compatible out of the box with the FGT Elite, the GT Elite and the GT Track. Uh, although I would prefer the pivot bar to be all one solid piece. So there were 16 bolts in total that we had to put in on that. And I did notice a little bit of flex in that uh, to the point where I could imagine it would work its way loose over time. Now, it did come with good quality steel bolts and uh, nylock nuts as well. So it's not like it's gonna come loose all the time, but I think that would be better if it was one welded piece. It would make the box a little bit bigger, but you know, it is what it is. That's just one little area of improvement there. Tidy once installed, only one USB cable and power cable and nothing else to manage. So all the other motion systems that we've looked at when it comes to full cockpit motion at least, all require cables to be run all over the place. You've got individual actuators, which all have to run back to a base unit. Oftentimes there's not really any way to mount that base unit to the rig itself. So you end up having that control module somewhere else on the, you know, on the floor. And it can just become messy and cable management can become a little bit of a nightmare. So this is definitely the tidiest full motion cockpit that we've ever used. And if you're wanting to have a sort of minimalistic look and you know keep things as basic and simple as possible, and I think that's definitely an important factor of consideration. So next positive, overall excellent software, and I don't use that word excellent lightly, uh, with a variety of extra features, including tactile feedback for things like vibration transducers and uh, OBD2 emulation too, if you wanna use gauge clusters and things like that from real race cars. Now I use the word overall excellent rather than just straight up excellent because there is one nitpick which I'm gonna make when we get into our negatives in just a minute. But overall, yeah, it was an excellent experience with this software. And I've, I have used this software for many years now because I had the NLR V3 motion platform, the seat mover before. So great game support with little to no hassle getting things to work. Pretty self-explanatory there. Next Level Racing have always been really good at adding support for new games relatively quickly after they come out. So yeah, they've got really good support there and you're not gonna be left in the dark waiting for support for your favorite game if something new comes out. So that's a good point. So next positive in relation to the software once again is the inbuilt motion compensation for VR 
and experimental support for fixed monitors too. Now, admittedly, we didn't actually find that we needed it with pitch and roll. It's been a similar experience with the other motion systems that we've tested over the years as well. Once you start to get into sway and yaw or traction loss, it can definitely make a difference. But if you are using a large amount of movement here, remember again, I said that we were using a relatively small range of movement that may well end up being something that you find beneficial. So definitely something worth considering there. Now, there are a couple of different schools of thought when it comes to relative movement between the screen and the steering wheel and your body. Now, in the case of a seat mover, I always found that I didn't find it to be as big of a problem as people often thought it would be, simply because the seat mover is kind of simulating the sensations that you feel in your body in the seat of a real car, rather than simulating the physical movement of the car, if that makes sense. So even though your body's moving around, the wheel is in a fixed position relative to the screen. Whereas when you've got the entire rig moving, obviously the steering wheel and everything else is moving in relation to the screen as well. Now to put it in the proper context, if you look at footage of people sim racing, oftentimes they've got the dash kind of bouncing around on the screen anyway, so you already have that relative movement. So in my experience at least, again, within the range of movement that I would recommend you use a motion platform, I just don't think it's gonna be a problem. Obviously if you're filming content like what we do in our triple 65 inch 4K rig, then that opens up a whole new can of worms. But for just general enjoyment of sim racing, I don't think that the motion levels provided here are gonna be enough that that is really gonna be a problem for anybody. But again, really great that they do include the option there just in case you do find you need it. Same case with VR as well. I just don't find that the levels that you're moving around is enough to throw the VR headsets that I've tested out of calibration. So next point, consistent experience across sim titles. Now we already touched on this briefly before, just to unpack that a little bit further. That's important because you don't wanna have the same types of cars feel completely different from each other in various different sim titles. Obviously muscle memory is something that's extremely important and anything that takes away from that is gonna be frustrating. You're gonna find, oh, I don't really wanna drive this other sim because it doesn't feel the same as what I'm used to. So having that consistency is something that I always check for with any type of hardware that's actually providing force feedback or some sort of tactile feedback back to you. Next on the list, high quality hardware with a compact footprint. Now I was really impressed with the quality of hardware when we had a look inside, didn't really see any points of weakness in terms of the construction. Obviously you would expect that for the price that you're paying here, it is not a cheap piece of hardware by any means, but the relatively small footprint may well be something that is important to you. Most motion systems add at least some bulk or some width to the, to the system because you're mounting actuators outside of the rig in most cases, whereas this actually sits within the footprint if you look at the wheel deck uprights of the uh, GT Elite that we've got it mounted to. Although on that point, it is important to note that it will raise your rig up a little so if you have sensitive height adjustment on your monitor stands, for example, you may find you have to end up raising your monitors and you may end up maxing them out depending on obviously the monitor stands that you have. So that is a consideration. Relatively quiet at idle. That was another thing that I liked about it. You can hear the fans whirring when it's switched on, but it's certainly not loud enough, at least at idle, to bother anybody. And then lastly on my list of positives, I have provide 70 to 80% of the immersion that you get with a D-Box system. I drive with a D-Box G3 system, which costs twice as much here in Australia as this system does. So that is a pretty big positive there. I would go as far as to say that it would be more like 80 to 90% if this system had engine vibration. That is one thing that is definitely missing from this that we have had with other systems that we've tested in the past. So I'm really hoping that that's something that we do see in the future. It is a software based thing, so there's no reason they couldn't add it later on in firmware and software updates. But as of the time of making this video, at least, it's not something that you have. And that does take away from the immersion compared to other systems. But I was actually really surprised that not having Having that third degree of freedom in terms of heave or movement up and down on the rig didn't really pull away from the experience as much as I thought it would compared to my D-Box system which I run every day on my rig. So a pretty extensive list of positives there. Let's move on now into the negative points. So the first negative is it's quite noisy in operation compared to alternatives. So just so you guys know, my threshold for drawing attention to that is whether or not I can hear it through my headphones at the volume levels that I like to drive at. And in the case of this unit, I can. In the case of the Sigma Integrale system that we tested recently and my D-Box system, I can't. So we definitely need to highlight that. Uh, noticeably more robotic feeling overall compared to some of the alternatives that we've tested as well. So although there is a lot of uh, I guess high fidelity granular detail in what you're feeling. It does have a slightly kind of robotic or jagged kind of feeling to it. Doesn't quite have that same level of smoothness that we've found on some other systems. 
Third negative, and this is something that we already mentioned a little bit earlier, no engine vibration effects at the time of filming this. And that does add a lot to the overall immersion. Obviously you can add those things with tactile transducers, but on my daily driver rig with the D-Box and when we tested the Sigma Integrale system, which is much more closely matched to the price of this if you go with the three actuator system, uh, that was able to provide enough of that tactile feedback that I didn't actually feel the need to run any vibration transducers on the rig at all. Whereas if I bought this, I would probably still wanna have some of that tactile feedback on top of what this provides. So that is something to think about. Again, I'm sure that they will add this at some point. It is a software based thing, but at the time of filming, it's not there. So we need to call it out. Uh, next negative, and again, this is a software thing. Every time you wanna change between games, you have to select the profile that correlates with that game. It doesn't automatically switch profiles like software like SimHub does, or even the D-Box system does, for example. So that, I mean, it, it's not a big deal. It's not a, it's not a deal breaker by any means, but it is another thing that you have to remember to do every single time you jump into a different sim title. And if you're quickly jumping into an online race, you're about to start, you're waiting on the grid and you go, oh crap, I haven't set my motion up. You are gonna have to alt tab out. And the reality of that is two things. Either you're gonna potentially miss the start of the race because you're alt tabbing and trying to sort things out, or you could end up starting the race without motion, not realizing until you get underway. And of course, because your body is used to having that feedback, you actually find that your muscle memory isn't working properly you end up being way slower than you would have been with the motion installed. Now that is not to say that motion is going to make you faster overall but anything that changes in your normal experience will definitely have an impact at least in the short term. But we'll talk about the impact on actually driving quickly and consistently in our conclusions in just a minute. Now the next negative point is probably my biggest concern with this unit and that is that the rig moves quite a lot when you're not driving due to the lash in gears. Now you may have noticed in this footage that we're filming right now the rig's moving around a lot less than it was earlier on in the video. What we found is that when we moved the module to the back of the rig, because it's more heavily loaded, it's got more weight sitting directly on top of it, there's a lot less movement in the rig, but it is still there. If I really kind of rock the thing from side to side, it does still sort of try to stand up on its end. Whereas just kind of sitting here and talking, it's not wobbling around at, at least to the same extent as it was when it was mounted in the front. Now, Next Level Racing do recommend that you mount the actuator module up the front. In my experience, I actually found that I preferred the feeling of it in the back. But again, we'll talk about that in our conclusions in just a minute. But I definitely think that that's something that's important to consider, particularly if you're a streamer or you're filming videos, or maybe if you've got some sort of a rig set up where you actually have a keyboard and mouse and you use it for your day-to-day -day work as well as sim racing. Quite a few people actually do do that, so it's not as silly as it might sound. You're not gonna wanna have the rig kind of bouncing around and feeling like you're sitting in a boat all day when you're trying to do work. But overall, once you're up and driving, it's not really something that you notice at all, but when you're sitting in the pits or when you're just sitting in your rig, you are gonna feel that movement from left to right. So consider that. Now this is a nitpick rather than a full-blown negative, but one other thing that did frustrate me is the location of the power switch and the lack of a physical emergency cutoff switch. Now admittedly, other motion systems on the market that cost a lot more than this also don't come with physical emergency stop buttons, and you do have a hot key that you can assign on your keyboard as an emergency stop button if you want it. But if you want to physically turn the unit off, it's quite a pain in the ass to kind of have to get up from the rig, reach around underneath and reach that power switch if it's at the back. And at the front, if you've got your rig up against the wall, again, you've got to kind of have to stick your hand in there and flick it off every single time you want to switch it off at the wall. So again, you could just switch it off at the power point in another location, or you can add an inline switch to your power cord. So it's not a massive deal, but at 5,000 Australian dollars, I would like to see a physical emergency cutoff switch, which you can use to cut the power to the module. And lastly on the negative list, and this isn't something that's specific to this particular unit, but all motion systems in general, it is going to add a lot of weight to your system. It is going to make it cumbersome to move around. So if you're needing to slide your rig around or move it into different positions, then it is gonna be more difficult than if you had the rig on wheels. So definitely something important to consider there. So overall, in conclusion, I think the most important thing here is to preface this by saying, that I am used to driving with a very, very expensive D-Box motion system, costs twice as much here in Australia as what this guy does. So in the back of my mind, when I've been reviewing this, I've been thinking back to when I did my review of the motion platform V3 almost four years ago now, and just how blown away I was with the experience of using that. I'd never used any kind of motion system in a sim rig before that experience. And if you go back and watch those videos, I was just absolutely filled with joy and just absolutely blown away by the new levels of immersion that I was experiencing with that system. Now, fast forward four years, and obviously I've had a lot more experience with a lot of different systems, and that has kind of numbed that initial impression that I get with a lot of these systems. So with that in mind, what I would say is that it definitely is a good product and absolutely a significant step up 
from something like a seat mover. If this is gonna be your first experience with motion, honestly, you're gonna be absolutely blown away with it and you're gonna absolutely love it. But it would be a lot easier to recommend if it were that little bit cheaper, even with our 5% discount code link down in the description. It is a tough sell when you consider some of the other competition which is available. That Sigma Integrale system that we tested recently, uh, we did test the four actuator system. We haven't tested it with three actuators yet, but that does come in a lot closer to the price of this system than something like a D box and in my experience at least and remember again a lot of this is very subjective I would choose something like that over something like this I think that that just does gives you a smoother overall experience while it may not be quite as refined in some areas the fact of the matter is whichever way you package it at this kind of price point there are some alternatives that are worth considering so some of those we've tested here at Booster Media some we haven't and I would definitely recommend go and watch some other reviews from some other people get as many opinions as you possibly can on this kind of thing because it is a very very very, very expensive thing to be putting on your sim rig, especially when you consider what we're gonna talk about now, which is the fact that when you're spending this kind of money, you need to be mindful of the fact that what we're doing here is purely just adding more immersion to the sim rig. In my experience with a variety of different motion systems, I've never found that any of them have actually made me any faster or any more consistent. Now that may sound counterintuitive because you're thinking, well, you're getting a greater sensation of what the car's doing. What you'll find is that your brain adapts to the information that's present, particularly when it comes to you know high quality pedals, a nice solid cockpit, and a good quality force feedback steering wheel. As long as you've got all of those three points and your feedback that you're getting through the wheel is consistent and you know giving you the sensations that you need to feel the attitude of the car in my experience at least and the majority of people that I've spoken to that have experienced full motion systems we all agree that you're getting all the information that you need to drive quickly and consistently just between what you're seeing on the screen and what you're feeling through the wheel and of course the quality of the pedals and not having any flex anywhere and even to the point where if you add too much motion as we said before it can actually be detrimental because it's just giving you sensory overload it's rattling you around and it's impossible to establish good quality muscle memory obviously in a race car you want to try and remove as much stuff as much noise from the experience as you possibly can and it is a very fine line between noise and actual useful information so with a motion system like this and this goes for all motion systems it really is just about adding that extra layer of immersion and making the experience more enjoyable not necessarily going faster so you definitely need to consider that when you're thinking about spending this kind of money on your sim rig so for me ultimately what it boils down to for this if you know that you want motion on your system and you're looking for something that's simple and easy to integrate then i think that this is a very strong contender particularly if you already have a next level racing rig that this is directly compatible with and you're not strong on DIY, definitely nice and easy to install. Although they don't include any tools, which was a little bit funny for the price. I would have liked to have seen them include a couple of tools just to make things a little bit easier. But most people have Allen keys from building their rig anyway, so I don't think it's gonna be a major issue. But look, ultimately, if this is your first experience with motion, then you're gonna be absolutely blown away, as I said before. It just comes down to whether or not there are better alternatives at a similar price point. And a lot of that's gonna come down to shipping costs in your area as well. So do your research, watch a bunch of other reviews as well. And I'd encourage you, watch some of the other reviews from people that have tested this rig that don't have experience with other motion systems as well. Look at how much they're enjoying it. And I think that's gonna give you a good idea of how much you're gonna love something like this if you do choose to fork out the money. But just again, be mindful of the fact that it is an incredibly large amount of money to spend on something that at the end of the day is only gonna add immersion to your experience. It's not gonna make you any faster. It's not gonna make you any more consistent. And there are definitely a lot of other things on the rig that I would prioritize in terms of spending money before buying motion. Obviously a solid cockpit, good quality force feedback steering wheel and high quality pedals are way, 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 way more important than spending money on a motion system. But if you already have all of those things and you got the money to spend, then by all means, check this one out. So I really hope that this video has helped you guys out. If it has, please do leave a thumbs up. That is a massive help to us. Consider subscribing to the channel as well so you don't miss future videos. We're thinking about chucking this up on top of Next Level Racing's Traction Plus system as well to check that out, see what that experience is like. So you can stay tuned for that one. Head on over to boostedmedia.net to check out our other reviews. And if you have decided you wanna pick up one of these guys or any other Next Level Racing products, don't forget that 5% discount code with our affiliate link down in the description. That is an awesome way to help support the channel and save yourself a little bit of cash in the process. And that goes for a lot of other brands as well. If there's anything else that we've talked about in any of these videos, check out boostedmedia.net for all the details and some discount codes for various different things. So thank you very much for watching guys. We will see you again very soon. Bye.